Why am I holding an iron and a pair of scissors? Well, it relates to today's video on my sewing tips and tricks that can help you to be able to identify well-made items as well as not well-made items and just kind of see different, different sewing techniques and things and how they're affecting the garments you might be wearing. And when I sew, I spend more time with the iron and scissors than I do, believe it or not, with a sewing machine or with a needle and thread because a well-made garment is well-pressed and also your seams are cut correctly. We will get into some of that in this video. Let's get into this. Thanks so much for joining me on my video of 10 sewing tips and tricks that can help you in purchasing and identifying well-made garments. I'm Nancy Ann, if you've not been here before. I normally do all sorts of different types of unboxings, everything from different types of food to you name it, at journal junk box, I've done book unboxings, uh, all sorts of things, tea, cross stitch, you name it. Uh, mostly I do clothes and in doing those unboxings, I've often mentioned different things I know from sewing about what is making a poor and a well-constructed garment. And I've had people ask me to please do more. I think I've pretty much emptied my brain of all of the things that can help just the average person with their shopping. Uh, over the course of the videos, but I thought I would make a video that includes all of them. And I think a couple of you have actually asked me to make this video. So thank you very much if you did that. I love getting video ideas. I can't do all of them, but I really like to implement some of them when I can. This is Ruger. Most of you have met him, but this is my boy. And I backed the camera up so everybody could get a little look at our guy as he takes a nap while mama does a video. This could get long. Um, I like to chat. Uh, I've never done a video like this before, so I tend to ramble a little bit more when I'm not as familiar with a video structure. So grab yourself a cold beverage, sit back, and let's learn a little bit about sewing things that can help you with your purchasing experience. Now, I've noted 10 things and they're not in any particular order, so they may zigzag over each other as we go, but we're gonna start out with droopy coat buttons. So a lot of people say, my coat button is too loose. You see this? And they feel like that loose button right there, let me see if I can show you, there we go, is going to fall off and they're very concerned about that. Coat buttons, especially on real thick fabric, this is a wool felt. And it's doubled because it's lined on the inside. So there's two thicknesses to this thick wool. Coat buttons need to be a little bit loose. And they also have something, often this one doesn't, but it's called a shank, where the button has a little piece that sticks off on the backside here. That's simply to keep the button from popping off when you wear it. So you need some looseness. They're sewn that way on purpose so that when you button it, it has some give for both layers of the fabric on the top as well as the button but also for your body taking up what they call ease ease is extra room in the garment for your body and for movement as you move around if you get that button on there too tight and you move the wrong way pop it's going to fly off and you may not be able to find it now this button on this shacket is a little bit different than that one this one doesn't have holes on the top it's sewn entirely from the back, there's a hole in the back of the button that they loop it through. This one, they it has holes in the middle of the button, so they so the traditional way where you go all the way out and then all the way back down through the through the fabric. But this one also is going to be sewn just a little bit loose to accommodate the fabric. Now this one isn't as loose as this one because this fabric is thinner, but you still want just a little bit of looseness there. So and also if you ever lose a button. Just real quick, grab it if you can and just stick it in the pocket because even if you forget about it for a little bit, it'll be right there in the coat with you to fix it when the time comes. Tip number two is bias cut fabric. Now this can be a sign of one, good drape and two, often good quality. So bias cut fabric is where it is cut on the diagonal and this is the best example I have and I don't know if you can see but the grain of the fabric is going this way. Now fabric has something called the nap and the nap goes in the crossways of the fabric. So it'll stretch more, whoop, there went my hanger, more in one direction 
than it usually will in the other. So in this direction, it's not, let me get on the true grain. It's hard because it's biased. So this one, there's no stretch to the fabric. But when I go opposite of that, there's plenty of stretch. Well, when you sew or when you cut the garment so that it is on the bias, so that it has the diagonal um, grain to it, like this one, you get a very nice drape to your fabric and it tends to hang more softly and really more flattering over the body. Now, why is this more expensive? Well, A, it's a little bit harder to cut this. Your fabric wants to shift and move around more as you're cutting when it's on the bias because it's not holding itself straight. But the other reason is because you can get more pattern pieces on a piece of fabric when it is cut with the grain instead of diagonal on the grain. Let me show you how that works. So let's say this is my piece of fabric and this is my pattern piece. I have this laid on my cutting surface. I can get many more pieces going this way than I can if I tilt it and this is how they get a bias cut going this way. That way I was going to get at least four here. I'm going to get two, maybe three. So what happens is for the manufacturer, they're going through more fabric to create you a bias fit garment. So that's why this is a very nice, um, very nice brand. This is, well, it's Gilly, but it's more expensive than like your cheaper brand. But the front of it is cut on the bias. And so it makes it a little bit more expensive because they're going to get less of those pieces to work with. Now on the back, they did not cut on the bias. On the back, it is still straight grain. So I also noted that when I purchased it, that they didn't do both. The other thing I want to tell you about bias is bias, because it is more stretchy on the diagonal, it's going to stretch out more on your pieces that are cut on the bias. Now in this shirt, they were smart. They made the front intentionally longer than the back. So it's not too noticeable. But as time goes on, if you have a piece you like and you just can't figure out why it's, why it's sliding, <laughs> sliding out of shape and you paid a lot of money for it, it's because it's cut on the bias. And just take it to someone and it's a pretty inexpensive tailoring alteration to just shorten that a little bit. But they were smart. They cut this on a curve on the bottom so that it can kind of accommodate for that bias as it sinks down over time. And that bias cut also, by the way, helps this cowl neck to drape better. The third tip was to try something on in the same size if it's not fitting you right. So let's say you're at the store and you're trying on a pair of jeans and they're just a little bit too small, just a little bit, or they're a little bit too small just in one place. For me, it's usually my hips. Or they're just a little bit too big in one place. Usually that's my waist. So you go to the next size up, but those are just too big. There's no way, they're gonna slide off of you. Go back and get all the other ones of the first size, I'd go with the size that was closest to your real size. So for me, it's usually the smaller size. Go, so if I'm trying on a 10 and it just feels a little tighter than I'd like through the hips, I'm gonna go, at first try a 12, nope, 12's too big. Go back, get all the 10s in your size of that style. <laughs> and I'm gonna try all of them on because it could be that one of them, the person who sewed them on the assembly line was off just a little and that one will fit you better. If that doesn't work, go back and get all the 12s and try those. Because even though there is an assembly line and they are very standardized and quality control really should catch these kind of mistakes, they can't catch if the seamstress is off by a 16th of an inch. And in sewing, you go by 16ths of an inch. A inseam, at least in American sewing, is 5 eighths of an inch. So that's, that's a tiny amount, the 1 eighth. But a 16th can throw it off. And I've pointed this out before. But in something that has multiple seams, let me see if I have something here. Well, here, let's, let's use this uh, for an example. So of the seams that go all the way around, you've got these two in the front count each of the, as a seam. You've got two sides. So that's, this is one, two, three, four. And then look, there's two coming down in the back, five, six. If you're off by a 16th of an inch on each one, each one of these is gonna be an eighth because there's two pieces coming together. One eighth, two eighth, three eighth, four eighth, five eighth, five eighth, six eighth. You're three quarters of an inch either bigger or smaller if that 
person on the assembly line was off by just a sixteenth of an inch. Now they really do try to standardize it, but they can't control it. And sometimes, even if it's a quarter inch difference, it can make a difference in how that garment will fit you. My fourth tip is to look for finishing details that make a garment look more expensive. Now my best example of this is this jacket right here that I just had. The brand is City Chic. I got these from Adia & Co. Um, it's not an expensive brand at all, but I love this jacket and I wear it all the time because there's details in this that just make it look more expensive than it is. So let's start off with all of the edges are finished. Nowadays they have raw hems and they're making them sound fancy. And I have a pair of raw hems right here. This is a pair of Hudson jeans. Now I got these from a front door fashion and they're expensive. These are um, luxury denim. But this is a less expensive detail, obviously, because they don't have to take the time to finish the hem. And you know, one beef I have with these, I'm going to chase a rabbit trail for a minute, rabbit trail alert, is they could put a stitch right here, a quarter inch up from that raw hem, and that would stop this raveling from happening so far up. But the advantage to these is if you don't have real long legs or you want your jeans a little bit shorter, you can have them finished off quite a bit easier than if they do have the finished edge. You just turn it up and sew it or use some, use some hem tape. So finished edges does make things look more finished and more expensive. Covered seams or French seams. Now a French seam is hard to explain. Normally you put your right sides together so your raw edges are on the inside, but with the French seam, they put wrong sides together. So then you've got your raw edges on the outside, but then they trim the raw edges down really, really close, tuck it back in. They actually use your iron a lot for this. And then you stitch along it so that that covered wrapped seam is on the inside of the garment. It's a very tricky time uh, consuming process. And if you find a French seam like that, you've got a good quality garment that the manufacturer really cared to put, you know, even the inside is, is cared for and it's done by hand, by the way, too, which takes a lot more time. But in here, we at least have, uh, it's a flat felled seam is what it's called with the serger. And they're all they're all cut off, there's no raw edges. This is surged very, very well. Serger is an overlock machine. It does um, the cutting and it overlocks the edges of the fabric at the same, same time to give a finished look to the inside. So this is a nice, neat look on the inside. The other thing is things like piping. This has piping right here. It's hard to see. It totally matches the fabric, but there's piping that's sewn into the seams. That's a difficult technique too. We've got a little pleat at the back of the shoulders. Can you see that right there? And then at the front at the shoulders. Now, sometimes these little stitches, they are, oh, let me pull that back so you can see it. They're actually that they messed up on the gathering and it got folded instead of gathered softly. But these are on purpose. And how do I know? Well, because first of all, they're evenly on each one. That's really the biggest tell. There's that one. And also, they're evenly spaced from the front to the back. So that's a really nice little detail also that kind of makes a garment look more expensive. The other thing is, just on this particular jacket, can you see how this seam, they have this extra piece here in the front? And let me see, is it pieced on the inside? Yes, it's pieced and sewn on the inside. That is more time consuming. It's not necessarily trickier, but it's more time consuming. Let me show you. So there's the seam on the inside that made this really cool lined piece on the outside. So these things, especially to the trained eye of someone who sews, this just makes this piece look and feel more expensive than it really is because the quality of the fabric isn't all that. But all of these details, down to the piping on the cuff, all of these details make this look like a high-end garment. I keep putting this away, but it's an example of many of my points. So my point number five is more vertical seams can equal a more fitted garment. And for that, I'm gonna use the example of the back of this coat. I grabbed this one because it just made so many of my points for me. So we've got a seam here and a seam here instead of just the seam down the middle of the back. And also then it's combined with the seams on the side. So on some jackets even, you'll see there's the 
center back is sewn down. Then you'll also have these panels here. And sometimes you'll even get an additional one that kind of comes out from the side seam at an angle. And the more gar pieces you have, the more vertical seams you have in there, the more fitted your garment will be because they can cut the pattern piece to be shaped like this more instead of like this. And then they piece them together and that helps give you that nice fitted look. The next one, unfortunately, I don't have a good fabric example for you, but this one is you want to make sure that your pattern or your nap are all going in the same direction. Now, when I sew a pattern, the instructions will have sometimes, usually, with nap and without nap cutting instructions. If the fabric is shiny, or velvet, that's a big one, or just has a pattern that is one direction. You have to cut the garment a particular way or else you're gonna wind up with an upside down piece. And I see this happen on pieces that are velvet more than anything else, and I see it in stores. And I just wanna smack my head because they're not paying attention to how it's being sewn and quality control doesn't know any well, but any better. But velvet lays in one direction. You can run your hand down it and you can feel it smooth and you run it the other way, it feels rough. And if the back of your pants look darker than the front of your pants, even if it's a real short nap, in other words, the little hairs are really, really short on it, uh, velvet and velour, it's probably because they didn't cut all the pieces going the same direction. Same thing for patterns. If there's any sort of even subtle directional pattern, I was looking at um, a pair of pajama bottoms from my Wantable Sleep and Body Edit, and I don't know how many of you remember, but I said, let me check and make sure that this pattern is all going the same direction because it was a one-way pattern on those pants. So you really wanna check that, and I'll tell you what, either the nap or the pattern being upside down, that is a telltale sign of a, uh, it's really kind of shoddy construction. Also satins. If a satin looks darker on like on the back than on the front, the nap went the wrong way. It's because satins, um, the way that the fabric, the threads in the fabric run, it's only shiny really going in one direction or it just simply looks lighter because of the way that the fabrics are threaded through the fabric. Hey, if you are still watching this video, and I hope you are, hang around till the end. I'm going to have a little bonus tip and also hang around to the end because my husband always has some sort of blooper in there. And if you guys could make sure you hit the like on this, that would really help me a whole lot. This one's gonna have a hard time because it, it doesn't match up what my other videos are. And so the algorithm just isn't gonna pick it up. That would help me a lot. Okay, let's move on to our seventh tip. And that is that polyesters and synthetics don't mean it's a cheap garment. So people automatically assume that polyester is cheap because of the word, but let me tell you, there are different polyester blends, there are different polyester weights, there are different polyester weaves, and there are different polyester sewing techniques that can make polyester actually an expensive fabric. I have purchased polyesters that are sumptuous, they are beautiful, they are to die for and they're not cheap fabrics. Now you do have your cheap thin fat of polyesters. They stretch quite a bit. You wash them, they start to fall apart. This shirt right here, uh, when I purchased it, where did it, it fell apart on the side? This is from Wantable. And it's because this polyester fabric is not that expensive. And so when the needle pierced it, it kind of made a perforating thing and it started to fall apart. So I went to my sewing machine and I sewed it correctly and the shirt is fine now. But polyesters are not always made cheap. So don't assume because you are seeing polyester in an expensive garment that it is an inexpensive fabric. My next tip is more a care type of tip for your wool garments, and that is that wool loves steam. Now you really don't want to get wool wet. You don't want to put it in the washing machine, and particularly the dryer, because when you try it, it's going to shrink up. But when you are pressing it, put your iron, fill it up with water as high as it'll go, and put it on high steam. The trick is you need to use a press cloth. So this is, a eggplant Italian import wool, actually, that I made a trench coat out of years ago. And I learned it was actually with this fabric. The gal I bought it from recommended it to me. Her name was, I can't remember her name, but her, her um, site was called Gorgeous Fabrics. I don't think she's in 
she's running anymore. But anyway, she said, no, no, wool loves steam, but you need a press cloth. Now they do sell press cloths, but this is what I use. It's just a thin old dishcloth, always very clean, of course, but you just set this on top of your wool and then high steam with the iron. If you have the squirt function, I always squirt some water on it ahead, and then I come over it with that high steam item. It really helps your wool to press out nicely, doesn't burn the fabric, and looks good as new. Additionally, this coat is not wool, but it definitely has a wool feel to it, and I use the exact same pressing and steaming technique with this as I did my regular wool coats. So if something feels wool to you, go ahead and use that technique just to play it safe. You don't want to scorch your garment. It turns out those were tips eight and nine because eight was wool love steam and the nine was supposed to be about the press cloth. So let's move on to tip 10 and then I have a bonus tip for you. And the bonus tip is one a lot of you have heard me say over and over, but I'm gonna repeat it anyway. And actually tip 10 isn't gonna surprise you either. Tip 10 is make sure your stripes are matched. Mismatched stripes are a sure fire sign of a poorly constructed garment. Now people don't get too worried about this, a lot of people, and honestly, if the stripe is really small, I mean really small, I don't worry about it. That's a really hard match to uh, make from, from a seamstress standpoint. But when they're bigger and those horizontal stripes don't, is that horizontal? This is horizontal. Don't match on the side. That makes me crazy. They should match. It is a little bit more work and it's also a sign of higher quality. Although there are some low quality garments I've seen that had the stripes matching, matching on the side and kudos to them. That is always encouraging to see that. But it's real easy to line those up and make sure your pattern piece works, at least reasonably easy, and then you cut. And the trick with cutting out striped garments is normally, at least in home sewing, you're sewing, you're cutting a double layer. So the fabric is folded over and you're cutting through two. But with stripes, you have to cut them one at a time to make sure that your stripes are going to match up. To a large degree, plaids should match. I'm not as picky as plaids with plaids because they are so busy and it's very, very difficult to make them work. And it's much easier to not notice that they aren't matched up. But at least, at least right here under the arms, I like to see plaids try and match. It just gives more symmetry to the garment going down. What happens a lot of times with stripes getting uh, mixed up and Sometimes you'll see the same striped shirt in, on a rack, and some of those shirts will have matched stripes and some won't. And you're like, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. And this is one thing that kind of got Lula Rowe into trouble, is they're putting too many pieces of fabric together to cut. And then they're using a machine to cut them, of course, instead of a human. But as the pressure is being put down to compress those garments to cut them, the ones on the bottom or the ones on the top or the ones in the middle, they shift a little bit. And a lot of times they shift more on the bottom where more pressure is being applied. So when, when they go to cut, the bottom one is completely askew because sometimes they'll cut a pile of fabric this thick. So a high quality garment, every single one will match because they're cutting them one at a time. Maybe two if they're very careful about how they uh, line those stripes up against each other. So there's a thing, that's, that's why a lot of times it gets mixed up uh, or messed up. And the other thing is that's also why sometimes you'll have a shirt that it starts hanging lower in the front, like this one is, and it's because they created a bias by shoving too many pieces of fabric together, stacking them too much, and when it shifted on the bottom, it made a slight bias, and now your shirt will start hanging lower sometimes on one side. So keep that in mind too. Another note about bias, I should have mentioned it back with a bias tip. So on dresses, this is the best example I had, but on dresses like this, it has an A-line where the skirt goes out to the side. So right here, my nap is gonna be straight and it's probably never gonna stretch, but as it goes out to the side, it can start stretching over time. And a lot of times when they sew garments, they will let it hang out for several days before they finish the hem. Then they use something called a hem marker. They make sure it all gets all straight and they hem it because as it hangs, 
that bias will stretch out on the sides a little bit and your sides will wind up looking a little longer. So if you have a dress that used to be straight across or a skirt or anything where it has a goes has a severe cut out to the side and it used to be all even and now you're like why do the the edges look longer well it's because that bias is stretching that's stretchier like we talked about earlier plus there is the weight of the seam of the two pieces joining together that's pulling it down as well and my last tip slash trick slash thing to look out for and some people aren't bothered by this but i am is mixed media it's where they have one fabric on the front and a different one on the back now in this case of this shirt, and I'm not gonna turn all the way around because I should have a cami on and I don't, but the back is the exact same fabric as these sleeves, which is different. It's the same color, but it's a sheer fabric. It's got a little bit of a pattern, whereas this cuff and the front is a t-shirt fabric. The back is the same fabric as this, and the back is the interesting part. I'm telling you right now, this fabric right here is more expensive than this fabric right here. Now in this one, it doesn't bother me because they put the t-shirt fabric in front to make the back kind of a surprise. But when they put this more expensive fabric in the front and they're no longer putting it in the back so much, that bugs me. And they're fancying it up by calling it mixed media, but really it was, we're saving money and charging you the same price for this shirt. Well, there we go. There are 10 tips and tricks to help you in your shopping and your care for your garments, along with one bonus. I wanna thank you very much for sticking with me to the end. If you did, I really appreciate you. I hope you've hit the like button. If you found this valuable or helpful or entertaining any, in any way, I would be honored if you would subscribe if you have not. I always love the comments down below. That's the funnest part of this whole thing for me is interacting with you guys. And with that, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for sticking around. We'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye and be blessed. This is another type of coat bucket. <laughs> mm -mm, it's not a bucket, it's a button.